Hello, and this presentation is called, What is Life History Theory? And it turns out, uh, to answer that question, we have to look at the concept of fitness. And fitness has two dimensions. One that we often think of when we hear the word fitness is somatic fitness. And this is everything involved in our physical growth and development and in sustaining our life. We also often think of this in terms of what we call physical fitness, and that can indeed be part of somatic fitness. Uh, this is a female bodybuilder named Nikki Fuller, and certainly she's physically fit. But from a Darwinian perspective, it's not enough to be physically fit, and sometimes it's not even important to Darwinian fitness because what matters is how many offspring you have or how much you contribute indirectly to the fitness of your close relatives. So there's also what we call reproductive fitness. And this has to do with having offspring who survive to have offspring who survive to have offspring, or in a more inclusive sense, assisting uh, close relatives who have offspring who survive to have offspring. And this photo then is quite a contrast to the photo of Nikki Fuller. Um, this is Nadia Suleiman, who set a record by having eight uh, in babies, giving birth to eight uh, children in one go, uh, which is certainly something very modern. Uh, this isn't at all a characteristic of traditional human populations. So subsisting and reproducing are interrelated but they're not the same thing. And the basic idea behind life history theory is that they're different kinds of investments and trade-offs have to be made between them. So these are competing possible investments and how evolution shapes how much we invest and when into growth and development and how much we invest and when into reproduction. That's what we call life history theory. So life history theory is all about explaining the trade-offs between somatic growth and development and reproduction. And that in turn shapes the characteristic patterns and phases of our lives. Now one way to think about this is in terms of actualities and hypothetical possibilities. So we all take fairly well for granted the basic patterns of human life history. If we look across traditional human populations, then on average, human females bear their first child at age 19. Now, we might pose a hypothetical, well, why not mat mature and have children at age 8? And all of us would recoil and we'd say, well, that's far too young. But the evolutionary question, the ultimate question is, why has that pattern evolved at age 19 uh, rather than a pattern uh, where childbearing would begin much sooner. At the other end of the spectrum, on average, uh, human females bear their last child in a non-contraceptive traditional populations around age 40. And we could pose a similar hypothetical. Well, why hasn't uh, evolution shaped uh, humans so that uh, women bear their last child at age 80? And again, we say, well, that's ridiculous, right? That's far too old. But the question is, why? Um, why has this pattern evolved where there's about two decades of reproductive years in traditional populations? So life history questions are all about, uh, for example, uh, why human females average five live births over those 20 years. Uh, why not 30? And we say, well, you couldn't fit that many pregnancies in. That's crazy. But the question is, well, why, why do pregnancies last nine months? And this then is all about, uh, life history theory is all about why we mature when we do, why we live as long as we do, and why we reproduce when we do. And the ultimate answers to these in evolutionary approaches, that all, it all comes down to natural selection. And the basic idea is that selection acts on patterns of growth and development. And again, that selection involves trade-offs 
between growth and development and reproduction. So these are the, in themselves different ideas or different things. Growth refers to an increase in the number or the mass of cells. So some cells like muscle cells uh, can get larger. Development on the other hand is about the differentiation of cells into different kinds of tissues uh, that form up our brains and our muscles and our livers and other organs. And reproduction is something different from both of them but very closely related. So we can divide up our, our features into what are called ancestral and evolved features. And an example of an ancestral feature of human life history is our basic energetics. And the way that we process energy, the ways our cells work and our tissues is, is very much what would be expected for a mammal of our size. So this is called a phylogenetic constraint. And the way that brains and livers and muscle and fat operates in humans and our hormonal systems, we get down to the cellular level and energetics and we're very much just another mammal. In terms of an evolved features, when we look at our energy budget and how that's distributed amongst different kinds of tissues, uh, here we see something rather unique, and this is called the expensive tissue hypothesis, and it has to do with the greater amount of brain tissue that humans have. So when we look at uh, uh, humans, we have about our energetics, the amount of energy we have available is just what we would expect uh, for a primate of our size. That doesn't change. But what's different is the amount that we're allocating to our brains as opposed to our digestive systems. So what would be expected for a primate of our size would be a much smaller brain, about 450 grams, and a much larger gut, almost 1,900 grams. But what we observe in humans is a much larger brain than expected, about 1,300 grams, and a much smaller gut, about 1,100 grams. Our liver is about the size that would be expected, and so is our kidney and our heart. And these are the five most expensive tissues in mammals that demand the most energy. So again, uh, for our brains to get larger, something else had to get smaller. And what got smaller was our digestive tract. How did that happen? We'll come back to that. So some features of human life history are derived or evolved and represent a distinctive evolutionary course. And these are part of what make us distinctively humans. And we're going to look at four of these that are discussed in a book called The Evolution of Life History, edited by Kristen Hawkes, um, who we've read some of her other work or discussed it. So one feature that's pointed to is humans have the potential for longer life than other primates. And chimpanzees, for example, in the wild have an average life expectancy of 45 years. So when a chimp female reaches age 15, she has 30 years left uh, to reproduce and have children. And uh, on average, she's going to die around uh, her middle 40s. Humans, on the other hand, uh, human females in traditional societies have a life expectancy of 60 or more years. And of course, in some societies, uh, human females are very long lived and lived as long as 120 years. <clears throat> when a human female reaches age 15, she has 45 years left or more. And one thing that we might be thinking is, well, this must have to do with a longer reproductive period, but this isn't the case. So what explains this discrepancy? Well, one key difference here um, is simply lower adult, adult mortality in human societies uh, than among chimpanzees, and this is in traditional societies. So infant mortality rates are not all that different between humans and chimps. Um, but adult mortality rates are much lower for human females than for chimpanzee females. 
Now again, we might be thinking, well, this must have something to do with human females having a longer reproductive life than chimpanzee females, um, but this isn't true. That's not the explanation. And in fact, that brings us to our second uh, key feature of human life history. And this is that human females have a long postmenopausal life. And this is years that you're alive after the last possibility of reproducing. So a second feature is the long postmenopausal life of human females. So chimpanzees, on average, uh, give birth to their last offspring around 40 years old. And it turns out that human females also give birth to their last offspring around 40 years old. So there's not a difference in the age of last reproduction. The key difference is that human females keep living much longer after bearing their last offspring. So chimps, on average, live about five more years after their last offspring. Human females live 20 or more years. And again, the question is, well, why would this happen? And a key difference here, then, that we're pointing to is that human females have a much longer post-reproductive lifespan than do chimpanzees. How to explain this? Well, three hypotheses have been offered on this. Uh, one simply says that this is a side effect of a longer life. Uh, humans live longer, and uh, what hasn't changed, what's phylogenetically constrained, is that age of last offspring, or age of last uh, live birth. Um, but this just raises the question, why do humans have a longer life uh, than chimps or gorillas? A second hypothesis is that this longer life provides time to raise that last offspring. Uh, but a question there is, why are we different from chimps? Why wouldn't chimps also need more time to raise their last offspring? Uh, chimps take some time to mature. A third hypothesis, and one that's kind of most uh, carrying the day currently, is grandmothering. Uh, that human females invest much more effort after their post-reproductive period in caring for grandchildren, and in doing this they raise the reproductive success of their uh, daughters. Again, a question we might raise here is, well, why are we different from chimps again? And it turns out that we are quite different from chimps. And this brings us to a third a distinctive feature of human life history. And this is that human mothers wean their offspring earlier and stack them. So among chimpanzees, uh, nursing goes on for five to seven years. And the births of offspring are based on average six to eight years apart. Here's a mother chimp uh, with her offspring. And chimpanzee females space out their births at some distance. Uh, humans, on the other hand, uh, nurse for one to four years in traditional societies. And similarly, the birth interval ranges from one to four years. And this means that human mothers often have offspring who are stacked uh, they're very close to one another, a year apart in age. And that's what stacking means. Here's a mother in England with three children that look about a year apart. And this is why human mothers need help. Uh, human mothers tend to have more offspring than they can care for themselves. And that leads us back to grandmothers. And the basic idea is that grandmothers then uh, help care for these extra offspring. So a fourth feature here is long adolescence and slow maturation in humans. So humans have an extended adolescence in this juvenile period on this chart is marked in green. And you can see that it's increasing as we go from small primates like lemurs to old world monkeys uh, like macaques uh, up to chimpanzees and to humans. Uh, humans have a longer adolescence, and this just it delays the start of the reproductive period, which ends again about the same time as chimps. So why does that happen? Well, there's two basic hypotheses that have been offered, and one is this is all about big brains for cultural learning. A uh, critical uh, response to this has been, well, do teenagers really learn that much? 
<laughs> and the argument is that in uh, traditional societies, uh, children, by the time they're about age 12, have learned a great deal about uh, plants and animals and living, and teenagers don't add much to that. The second argument is, well, it's simply about living long enough or maturing enough for human females to have bigger bodies, uh, which raises the likelihood of successful childbirth. And again, uh, that's a possibility. Uh, thank you for listening.